Let's move on to comparison with the literature. The first question that you may ask me is, should you include the literature in the introduction or framework session or in this section? Because if you pay attention to the structure that I introduced to you, you will find the introduction and framework should be done in like the second part of your IA. So should you do it here or should you do it at the end? The answer is it depends. So it depends on what kind of literature that you are using. And there are four main possible literature that you may use for your physics IA. Uh, the first one is called the formula, which you may find just simply from the source somewhere. Uh, or you can derive it from the fundamental law like f equal to ma and you maybe combine with several equations and you find out an equation at the end. Um, so this one, you should put it into the framework section or you can also include uh, the microscopic view which is maybe the particle view so if it is related to wave uh, it can be about wave as well so uh, that could be included into the background or framework also so that means the uh, very early section of your IA because without this uh, basically it is very hard to understand your methodology and all the things that you did earlier However, if you want to use other researchers, experiments or results um, or even in a more last resort or desperate situation, uh, I would say you can also use simulation for comparison. So for these two, number three and four, you could leave it for the end. So in, only in, you, in this section, when you compare the literature, then you can mention it. So in this video, we'll talk about what to do with each of these literature one by one. Okay, so the first one is called the formula or derived framework. Uh, to illustrate you a better idea, I will use an example. So let's say the formula that we use is the gravitational law. F equals to G M1 M2 over R squared. So uh, I chose this because probably you won't be doing this. I, I mean, not many people would do this because this is not quite doable. As you know, uh, the gravitational force between two normal objects will be very, very small that you can't really measure with the tool. So I guess this is a good way for me to not to give you an actual formula that you might be using, uh, but use it as an example. The way that you do, as long as you have your own formula, uh, should be very, very similar as long as you follow my steps here. So the first thing that you do, let's say you already finished your data collection and start doing this section. And what you have to do uh, in this approach is you have to measure the control variables. So let's say uh, in my this IA report uh, or study, I'm, st I'm doing the independent variable as the radius. So that means like a distance between two objects. And the dependent variable is the gravitational force. I just, let's say I just magically measure it. Okay, so um, what I have to do here is I have to firstly measure the control variable. So obviously M1 and M2, the two objects that I use, uh, will be control variable, uh, as well as the constant itself is constant, of course. So what I can do is for these two mass, I could use a maybe electronic balance to measure it. So maybe I find out, oh, it's uh, literally 1 kg or the other one is uh, 1.002 kg, let's say. Okay, so uh, in this case, then I would have a number and of, of course the uncertainty also. So maybe that will be uh, 0 0.0001 kg and this is also the same, All right, etc. So for some values that you cannot measure, like depend again, depends on what kind of IA topics that you're doing. Uh, some of them just can't be measured directly or it depends on the material itself. So like this one, G, then you can simply uh, research uh, to find, of course, trustworthy source uh, on the value of this. So you can do that as well. Uh, and of course, if you could try to find out the error uncertainty, abstract uncertainty of it also, so you can uh, use it later on. If you really cannot find, then maybe you can use the last digit, uh, but that is not very ideal, of course. So if you can uh, find out somewhere, you can mention the abstract uncertainty, that would be great. Step number two, what you have to do is, uh, then you can calculate using the formula, you can find, you can calculate the corresponding 
dependent variable with the independent variable. So independent variable in your original research. So let's say for our, I chose to be say one meter, two, three, two, all the way to uh, four to seven meter or 10 meter, let's say. Okay, so this is something I chose. So it's perfectly fine. You can still use this independent variable to substitute into the formula. So you can substitute into the R square here and you should be able to get the dependent variable, which is the force here, because you already got other uh, values in your formula, which are the control variables, of course. So in this case, you'll be able to generate a table of your independent variable and dependent variable, like what you do for your data processing in the earlier section. So that's step two. Step number three is, again, uh, similar to what you did for your own data, you can also do the absolute uncertainty. Uh, you can do calculation. Uh, that means doing the error propagation method by all the absolute errors you know. So like what you learned in chapter one or basically what you did in the earlier session for your own experiment data, you will be able to find the error of force. That means a dependent variable here. Um, the reason is because at the end, even though this is from the literature, uh, it would be nice if you can get the error bars also. It's not really about the formula itself. It's more about maybe, just maybe, let's say the mass that I use. I find out maybe uh, the way that I measure is terrible. So let's say, let's say it is not uh, like what I said. Let's say it is something else like, um, say, it is 1.2 plus or minus 0 0.5, no, um, let's say 0 0.1, okay? And the other one is uh, 0 0.2 plus or minus 0 0.1, let's say. Okay, I know you won't do it, but let's say. Then even though with this and the so-called literature equation, you will still generate a large error bar for sure, especially you can see this one, All right? So uh, we can still consider the impact of the error uncertainties and lastly of course uh, the ultimate goal of obtaining the absolute uncertainty is to plot it onto the graph of course so plot the data points so from the data table again using the literature uh, the formula to calculate the theoretical value shall we say uh, so that we can plot the data point together with its error bar so maybe in the data table you can also add the uncertainty of the dependent variable also uh, as well as for independent variable you can also say it uh, because that's also measure from your experiment too and you can plot all these things onto the same graph with your experimental data so the, the main idea is that uh, when you do this then you can compare your experimental data with the theoretical data because the experimental data for example back to my equation here is that I measure the R and measure the F right because I mean, I mean this equation may be wrong or maybe there there are something that affect my measurement right so I measure these for experimental but then when I do the theoretical I calculate from the equation so that is a different approach for sure so we'll try to see whether these two approach would show you the same relationship okay so let me just illustrate you the graph and give you an example on how it might look like so back to our formula here um, if we want to generate a linearized graph uh, quite likely you have f to be the y-axis and x-axis should be 1 over r squared and let's say in that case that uh, you probably should get a straight line in your experiment so let's say it is something like this and look at the slope well this is experimental data let me just write down here and look that the slope actually means this one right g times m1 m2 that is the physical meaning of the slope and uh, well let's just say uh, according to your error bar you can get the mass mean line to be something like these let's say okay so uh, you have an area of these and let's just say the theoretical one is uh, somehow like this okay let's say all right the theoretical one the blue one okay so uh, this is where the discussion starts 
And so for the first thing that you should consider, check and discuss is whether or not the theoretical, that means the literature line of best fit, the blue line, will line within your experimental mass mean line range. That means the red range here. So uh, the answer is obviously no in my example because you can see, yes, they are part of it. They will overlap each other, but then uh, you can see here it doesn't overlap at all. So there must be some problem or right, some disagreement between the theoretical and experimental data. So it's really up to you to judge whether or not there is an offset of X or Y. That means translation in mathematics or offset of the slope in itself. Um, you should not just think about the math, but also think about whether it fits to the physical uh, idea in your experiment. So for example, back to our example here, uh, you may judge that, just may, okay, uh, not necessarily. You may say uh, the experimental data, if it becomes deeper like this, then it will more match with the theoretical data and maybe translate to the left side so then that may be something to do with its slope first of all so that is to say uh, you have to look into its physical meaning as in as we said slope represent g times m1 times m2 so maybe there's overestimation or underestimation of m1 and m2 uh, when you try to generate the theoretical value and you have to see uh, since theoretical value is more steep right so then the slope is overestimated compared to the experimental one. So maybe uh, you overestimated M1 or M2 in this case. So there are different ways of working it out and uh, you really have to judge case by case and uh, it really depends on how your data look like. But these are some basic ideas. Next, the second thing that you can do is the microscopic view. So that is to check the particle theory. So in your background research, like the very early part of your IA, you should have done this already. And here is to just double check again, whether or not uh, the theory will match with your result qualitatively. So that is to say maybe when your independent variable increase, uh, how the dependent variable should react uh, in terms of values. So in some cases, when you have discrepancy in your graph, uh, it may also be very helpful uh, to explain the differences. So for example, I had a student uh, and the graph was something like this. Okay, and the expected line is more like this. All right, so the uh, the theoretical I should label here, right, the theoretical and the red one is the experimental. So we can see that the main discrepancy is around here and here. So the middle part is all good. Right, you can see nothing's wrong. Like, I mean, of course, I mean, if I could draw the uh, mass mean line, then it will be even better. So the main, main thing is uh, something is wrong at the beginning or at the end. So maybe you can think about the particle view. Something, maybe certain side effects in terms of the particles may happen and that may affect uh, your result. Uh, or maybe there are some assumptions that got violated or become more significant. Uh, in terms of the theory itself. Literature number three. So this is something that you could start to mention here, uh, and that is someone else's research. The first thing that you should pay attention is, uh, of course, the source of these experiment results should be trustworthy. So it cannot be something like another IB student's IA or ED report. Uh, ideally, at least it should be from the university. So it cannot be any kind of like blog or uh, Wikipedia or any uh, like a random website at all. Um, there should be uh, the name of the researchers and also the university's name also. The second thing that you should pay attention is uh, the range of the independent variable uh, that should cover the one that you have. Of course, uh, usually they do wider than yours because they are just more resourceful. And also pay attention to their assumptions. So maybe there are things that uh, they have assumed and you don't or the other way around. And that is uh, also worth discussion as well. The third thing that you, you may want to take, pay attention to is uh, the control variable. So maybe you are using a different kind of size uh, that may also bring in effect or even the methodology itself is different. So that's something that uh, 
I mean, these are not the thing that are saying, oh, if you are having a different uh, assumption or different control variable, etc., then you cannot use it. Right? It's more about, uh, of course, the research question should be similar or close and relevant together. Uh, but then maybe there are some of these that makes a difference. Uh, how do you justify, how you compare uh, those differences? And rule out maybe that would make a difference also. Uh, more importantly, after like you check all these things, uh, maybe you find out you can finally use it, then you can check whether or not the mathematical relationship. So once again, not just increase or decrease, it's more about the exact mathematical model. So linear, exponential, quadratic, inverse square, etc. Uh, of the independent variable and dependent variable, uh, whether or not it's matching yours and uh, their result. Uh, you can also do the similar thing like what we did earlier instead of using the formula uh, that we have to plot the theoretical value you can also use their theoretical value to uh, generate the same graph uh, and you compare like what we just mentioned earlier so then in that case uh, you can do the same thing and you try to find out maybe there are some discrepancy and you also discuss why there is a discrepancy there are some cases where you may not be able to find a clear mathematical relationship mentioned by the other researcher or even or even the slope itself. So what you can do is uh, at least probably you can at least find the dependent variable. And so you, what you can do is you can plot it on to again the same graph. And so you can then see uh, maybe the line of yours is more like the blue one and the red one is the res other researchers experimental data so then you can kind of compare them and also if you think there's a clear trend then of course you can also draw a line uh, for their data also or at least you can try to compare yours with uh, all the data that they have okay so we have covered the three main kinds of portable literatures and I will strongly recommend you to cover all these three in your IA so for most cases you should be able to do it uh, there are some cases where, uh, say, there were some students in the past told me they could not find other researchers' experiment. Uh, of course, a trustworthy source. Then uh, I would say you may also consider using simulation as an alternative for number three. So uh, in case you are using that, then you should note that uh, you cannot generate error bar in the simulation. So that may cause an issue, but then the rest should be uh, similar to what we mentioned. So you still generate uh, a trend and you plot them onto the same graph like what we did earlier, and you can still do the comparison. But once again, if you could uh, just do the first three, uh, it shouldn't be that hard to find a relevant researcher's experiment. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And lastly, once again, I want to reiterate, you should always, always consider the physical reason. Okay, I know this part involves quite a lot of maths, uh, but ultimately it's not a math IA, it's a physics IA. So you always should link and explain why there's a discrepancy uh, using the physical concept or ideas.